Good morning. Good morning. My pleasure to welcome you here in the name of this church, but much more importantly, in the name of Jesus Christ himself, you are welcome in this place. Um, I also add this, and it'll just add to that uh, list of things that you got. Is he losing his mind, um, or has he already lost it? But uh, I'll also wish you Happy New Year. Uh, today starts uh, a new year in the Christian calendar. Advent is the first season of the Christian calendar year. It's the four Sundays, the four weeks before uh, Christmas Day itself, a time of preparation and thinking about the arrival of Jesus into this world, but uh, just as much the expectation of his return. So today, may uh, life feel like it is starting over for you, taking into the new year everything that was good about your life, and trusting that God is going to make the coming year blessed in whatever ways that God sees his grace most effective for you. So today, you are welcome in this place and let joy, hope, love, and peace be yours. Um, a few announcements to start out with. Um, we are celebrating communion this morning and invite everyone to participate with us. Um, we're kind of taking a minor pause in the vision discussions. That doesn't mean that you can't uh, talk to a session member or send us an email about any thoughts that you have about the future of the church. Next Sunday, we're gonna <clears throat> start the visioning questions again, but uh, we do think and keep thinking about that. Uh, you should see in your bulletin a couple of inserts, one of them being uh, about poinsettias. If you would like to purchase one, uh, someplace for your choice and dedicate that in honor or memory of somebody we'll be glad to uh, have that listed in our uh, Christmas Eve worship bulletin and there's another one there <clears throat> that uh, this year we're um, doing the 12 days of Christmas uh, shopping for the recovery court and for Hopetown 
Uh, if you can't do all of these, uh, don't feel bad. If you can do one of these, that'll be great. Um, we uh, have a, already had a good response, so uh, just do what you believe you can do in terms of helping us out with any of those items and whatever number you'd like to, to uh, provide. Them. But it is there as a possibility for you. Um, we've already had several people asking for the simmering um, potpourri, I guess I should call that, but simmering mixtures bags <clears throat> uh, that the kids are making. So. If you'd like to get your order in, see Teresa or Emma or Ann about that as quickly as you can, because the kids are making those. Um, hopefully you noticed out front, uh, there's a new nativity set uh, out front. Um, I drove by quite early this morning and it looked like the cow and the donkey were gone. Uh, we've been talking about how long these are going to stay out there. But this is a Sunday of hope, and so we're going to conclude that it's just a good thing that those things are out there to remind people about the arrival of Jesus. But Dina Kruger and several other people, some, most of whom asked to remain anonymous, made it possible for us to purchase that, and it is a beautiful gift to the church and the community. Um, you see uh, some calendar items there. The kids are going to be presenting their Christmas presentation on Sunday morning here on the 17th. Um, you see that there's a trip to the Nashville Rescue Mission on Thursday, the uh, 21st. And then a Christmas cantata involving some of our choir members at First Methodist at 9.30 on Christmas Eve. And then our Christmas Eve services at 11 and at 5 on the day. Um, prayer concerns. Um, <clears throat> obviously, keep continuing to remember the family of Randy Crossland. Uh, Skyler Price, I suppose, remains hospitalized. <coughs> he is not. He uh, has a lot of bones to, to uh, heal, but he's gone home, so that's good. Nancy Johnson's grandson. George London will have <coughs> uh, back surgery tomorrow morning at Centennial, so remember him. <coughs> and I think Jimmy Moss is also at Centennial. And he will have a heart procedure tomorrow morning, so both of them in your prayers tomorrow. Uh, Sue Hill continues to recover at home, as does Bernie Fryer, and Donna Gillespie has made it home at Master for So some positive things happen for some folks. Any other announcements, prayer concerns? Hugh, yes, thank you very much. I only wrote it down here in red. Do you think I remember it? But, um, on Christmas Eve at the 5 o'clock service, we need some additional communion servers and ushers. We usually have a fairly full sanctuary on Christmas Eve. Um, so if any of the elders out there can um, volunteer to do that, please see you as quickly as you can. Just let me know that we've got uh, that covered. Other announcements, prayer concerns, celebrations this morning? Please note that in the first hymn, <clears throat> O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, we'll sing the first four verses. That notation is not in your worship bulletin, but the first four verses. On the front of your bulletin, it says the word hope. It is a gift to God to each of us. Let us rejoice in that this day and take it to heart. Let us worship God together. Jesus. 
And so we thank you for these moments where we pause to consider who we are and where we've come from, what we're about and where we're going. We thank you that you grant us this gift to be together. And then in our case, we get to worship without much fear, certainly not <clears throat> the kind of fear that many people in the world are living with these days. And so we ask that as we have more time and space in our heads and hearts, we might lend our prayers to those around the world whose thoughts are only in survival. And we ask, oh God, that their urgency of seeing you at work in this world will be shared and spread into our hearts that with one voice, we all together as one human race might thank you for your grace and lift up our voices in praise. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We invite you to stand for the call to worship in the lighting of the first Advent candle. Oh, all people everywhere, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem the whole world from all its iniquities. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, says the Lord my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And we will proclaim justice to the law, to the nations. We will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. He will put everything right. In his name will all nations put their hope. <laughs>
on any given day, I think, <clears throat> whether you're listening to the news or talking to a friend, or perhaps reflecting upon your own life, you find yourself running short of hope. It's easier to live in other domains than the domain of hope. It's easy to live in resentment and fear, numbness, perhaps even a dull sense of hopelessness. And yet we are people of hope, saved by hope, Paul says. Jesus often said to his disciples, fear not, only believe. He called his disciples to put his hope in him, his hope in the faithfulness of God, not in what we see with our eyes, but what we have come to believe about the character of God himself. And so on this first day of a new year, however we may reckon that, <clears throat> on this first new day that we have not had before, may we put our hope afresh in God. I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. Oh God, hear our prayers, for truly our hope is in you, despite how slow we can be to remember it. O oh Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. For if you hide your face, O oh Lord, we lose heart and sin. If you, O oh Lord, were to count sins, no one could be saved. If you were to abandon us, there would be no hope for any of us. Yet you, O oh Lord, love mercy and delight to show compassion and forgive sins. Because you are loving, there is hope for all. Because you are faithful, we know we must learn to trust you more and more. Because you are merciful, we ask now that your spirit make us merciful as Jesus is merciful. O oh Lord, hear our prayers and listen to the longings of our hearts. O oh God, our true Father, lift up your eyes upon us and give us peace. Amen. I want to tell you this, that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Rejoice, O nations, with God's people, Praise the Lord, all you nations, and let all the peoples praise him. The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the nations, and in him shall all nations hope. This day, claim the gifts and promises of God, and let hope be kindled afresh in you by the gift and power of the Holy Spirit within you, by the grace of Jesus Christ himself, to each one of you. Amen. Into who God is and who we are. 
Please join me in prayer. Oh God, please enlighten the eyes of our hearts, renew our minds, grant us fresh peace and a new sense of pace in life that we might not lag behind the steps of Jesus, but that we might not try to pass him on the way in our own self-involved sense of hurry. Let us breathe in these moments as we hear scriptures and as music enters our hearts and minds that we might be still and quiet and yet more alive than ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our first scripture will be from Mark 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. When the fig tree learn its lesson, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, 
you know that he is near at the very gates. Surely I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he suddenly comes. But what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, what do you think I got here? It's an ornament. In where, where do ornaments normally go? On the tree. Exactly right. This is kind of a silver color, don't you think? Yeah. A lot of the times when we come to church, you know, we, we want to make everything look pretty and nice, and a lot of people worked really hard yesterday to put all this here for us to look at, and it's a good thing. Period. Exclamation point. Wonderful. But you guys are a part of the church that's supposed to keep us on our toes. Did y'all know that you had that job? You're kind of supposed to make things a little bit different. You know, you're supposed to, you know, I don't hate to say this, but sometimes y'all are the people that are supposed to say, he's first long enough to let it go. You know, guys who sometimes run in church, right? You haven't seen me do that. And sometimes we get so serious at church, we forget that Jesus loved fun. Jesus loved people. He loved talking to people. He loved kids. I think if Jesus had his, his choice, he would have spent all his time with kids. But he had to work on people like me. And so this little ornament that Miss Emma found, it has the word hope on it. Hope. Now you may be hoping for some things for Christmas. You might be hoping for a particular toy or something. I bet y'all got some things you're hoping for, maybe, right? Well, this little reminder isn't just about the fact that you guys have a job to keep the rest of us kind of going and thinking and asking questions. But this is kind of a reminder that what you get for Christmas this year that you didn't ask for may turn out to be the best thing of all. Because we're not very good at figuring out what to hope for. So this year, if you're opening Christmas presents and it's not what you thought it was or going to be, guess what? It may be it turns out to be something better than you knew how to hope for. And for us adults, that's a given. Yes, we've been given. Our years are not the ones at all we were expecting. Because they don't come in the box. They come so Let us pray. Well, God, thank you for the gift of these kids and the hope that they inspired us by breathing and being with us. Please bless them with all that they genuinely hope for. Bless their parents and grandparents, all the people that have any influence on their lives to sustain these kids' hope. And we trust you to be their God and to be with them every breath that they take. May the seal and blessing of Jesus Christ rest upon them now and forever.
The second reading is from the Hebrew Scriptures, Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. The prophet speaking on behalf of his people, and indeed the whole world in a way, hoping that God will respond. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. The two scriptures that have been read as our text today don't really fit too well in Christmas, do they? They are disturbing passages about mountains quaking and fire, about the last day and judgment, about all things being turned upside down. Those, frankly, are usually the things that we're the most concerned about. And so hope, Christmas, and these kinds of texts can just feel awkward, like they don't fit together. I think that's the only way that hope can feel awkward, but that's the way initially these texts hit me, because day in and day out, what disturbs me most is that turmoil and what feels like the chaos of things just being turned upside down all over the place in the United States and around the world and in my own life. The sense of change too fast, too much is one of my biggest fears. And based on what I hear from people around me, I think it might be a lot of people's. It certainly does seem to be an odd hope that Jesus offers us there in Mark 13, that passage that Derek read to us. Jesus says similar things in other places when he talks about the future. 
But of course, if things are going okay for you, then those passages might be disturbing. But if things are not going okay to you, for you, they just might feel like hope. Sometimes all of us have wanted the world up, turned upside down because the way things are going, you can't take. And so when Jesus talks about the future and he talks about these dramatic, cataclysmic, almost catastrophic changes that are in the offing, it kind of all depends on which of those two categories you're in. That if things are going well for you, you'd like for them to keep going that way, and disturbing that is disturbing. And on the other hand, if you're one of those people who's struggling to find any hope anywhere, the fact that things might just be about to change in a big way might just be exactly what you want to hear. Yesterday, Emma and I spent time with friends who are Palestinian. And I have been in contact for the last several weeks with friends who are Israeli. Hope? What are they to hope for? That things keep going as they are? God forbid. Well, maybe they should hope for God to tear open the skies and come down. I have heard from friends in Bosnia in the last few days. They're not in the news, but everything over there just seems to be all but like a person with no family dying alone on the street with no one even taking note. But it's awful. It's awful. What am I to tell them about hope? What are they to hope for? More of the same? Or for there to be big changes? Like a lot of you, I've spent a lot of my adult life going in and out of hospitals and, yes, funeral homes. And what people are all longing for there is simply this, hope. But they don't want things to stay the way they are. They want change. Change for the better, but change. What are they to hope for? I've spent a lot of time in my life with people who have been pushed to the side or to the bottom or to the street or into jails. I've spent quite a bit of time with black people letting me hear how it feels to listen to our politics and our news reports. I've spent a lot of time with poor people hearing story after story about how much they've been told they scare people or bother people just by existing. In a world swirling in fear and doubt and distrust, is there really any place for hope? Or are the hard realities of human nature, mortality, evil, and death juice too much for any of us to be hoping for any more than just for things to kind of keep going okay for us. I myself struggle with hope because I've been exposed to so much hopelessness. And I've generated a fair amount of hopelessness for my own life, thank you very much. I haven't needed help from other people to dive down into what hopelessness feels like. And sometimes when I've been in places that are hopeless and you want to start talking about hope, it's almost too much. It's like almost inviting a clown to a funeral in the hopes that it's going to make everything okay. Somehow or another, inviting a clown to a funeral, it just doesn't sit right, does it? If hope is only about feeling a little bit better about your circumstances, then yeah, reality is going to catch up with you. But there is a vast difference between the way Jesus talks about hope and the way that we talk about hope. Most of the time when we talk about hope, we're really talking about some kind of optimism. We're looking at the tea leaves of life going, 
well, that looks like it could turn out better and that might happen if this election went that way or if we had this kind of investment to change, if, if things were just a little brighter in the weather. We're looking for signs and signals in what already exists to be the basis of our hope. And Jesus has no interest in that whatsoever. That's why he can say the kinds of things he does in Mark 13. He's painfully aware of the nature of human beings. He's painfully aware of the reality of suffering and pain and death. He's not looking to find some silver thread, some silver cloud among us that will generate his hope for the world. No, when he looks at us, he sees a group of people that left to ourselves are hopeless. It's hard to take that in because it means that Jesus' way of talking about hope comes from an entirely different source. In our world, the word hope is always on the ropes and is largely dismissed as little more than inviting that clown to a funeral to take our minds off of the reality around us, if for a while. Perhaps in a way, I'm a clown every Sunday trying to take your mind off of your problems. If so, and I'm not a very good clown, and I'm certainly not good at taking your mind off your problems. But for Jesus, hope is found only in one place, the faithfulness of God, which comes to us in all but silent ways this morning when I left the house, it was still dark. And I was really struggling with trying to figure out how to feel hopeful for all of you today. I was walking to my truck in the dark and looked up and saw a single star and realized I've made my world too small again. And as I walked into the sanction, into the church, the stained glass windows were lit. And it reminded me again, I'm not alone. And as I walked into the side door, I saw the moon half full and thought, God is still in charge of this world. It's the faithfulness of God that inspired the hopefulness of God, to Jesus, to be able to endure what he endured personally and to tell us that we can endure whatever we face. It's not found in your strength, your smarts, your endurance, your courage. It's found in the fact that you're accompanied by the God of all the world who has made to you unbreakable promises that God himself has sworn to keep whether you keep your end of the bargain or not. It's a one-sided bargain that God has committed himself to. He knows we are sinners. He knows we are mortal. He knows we fail. He knows we lose hope. And yet he has made these promises to all of us that he has sworn by himself to keep, come what may. Genuine hope takes seriously, deadly seriously, the problems of our world because God sure does and God sure has. We Christians have done the world and ourselves and even God a profound disservice by shrinking hope down to just our particular set of problems the way I was this morning. Instead, what God has done is make massive promises to this world. Massive promises. We know these scriptures, but somehow or another they don't sink into us because we are almost immune to hope. God has promised that every tear will be wiped away. Take that in for just a few moments. Into your own life, every tear wiped away and then expand it to the person next to you, and next to you, and next to you. So that it includes all Palestinians and all Israelis. It includes the entire world. Everyone who dares to call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And no one who puts their trust in him will be ashamed. God has made promises to wipe away all tears God has promised that evil will not win. It will not win in us, and it will not win around us. 
God has promised that death will not prevail, that even hell will not prevail. God has promised that the entire creation will be set free from all of the damage and wounds that sin and death have done to it, even with our human consent and cooperation. God has promised that the grieving will be comforted, the meek will inherit the earth, the dead will rise, that every wound done against genuine love will be answered and put right. Let us take pity on our friends in the Middle East because this is a hope almost too big for them to imagine. That all of the wounds and all of the hurts in all of the history of the Middle East, not merely in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but throughout human history in the Middle East, the birthplace of all of our civilizations, the pain and suffering that has been endured there, God has promised to answer every single instance of it. Yes, God is on the hook for the Holocaust. Yes, God is on the hook for Israel, Palestine. Yes, God is on the hook for every death from every disease, every grief, every wound you have suffered in the name of love will and has to be answered or God is not faithful. And God has given his own word knowing we ourselves make no such promises, much less the God. This is a massive, massive Christmas gift to all of us. A gift that no human being can even remotely imagine happening, much less causing. Yet God has put God's own faithfulness, God's own reputation on the line to do just that. Those words we read at funerals, those words we read when we are saddest, in those moments where you have stood and wept alone, those are the moments where God has sworn by himself that you will not stand alone. God has made this massive commitment to erase every trace of the existence of sin and death, every trace of everything except pure love. so that God is in all and through all and over all. God plans to win entirely. This tenacious faithfulness of God is the ground of all true hope. We are all in a long-term relationship with God, walking towards the same goal, the very one that God has set out for himself, the goal of God's redemption of all that exists, including the love and the cost of love that we and God have shared, and that God shares with all the love in all human hearts of all times and places. I struggle to care and to extend my care to just a handful of people, really. And yet God has poured open his very soul to all of us and sworn by himself, you are my child now and forever. And sin and death shall not claim one inch of God's creation. It in no way surprises Jesus that the world is in turmoil, in a scary state, it always has been, and until God tears open the sky and the return of Jesus, it always will be which is why the foundation of the Christian hope is the arrival of Jesus, that down payment of the faithfulness of God, that God is going to keep his word. That's the reason people were so excited and in turmoil around Jesus, because Jesus was daring to say that God is going to keep his word and you're seeing it happen right now. And it's not just for Jews, it's not just for the churchy people, it's not just for the people in the synagogue, it's big enough for everyone because at the end of the story, God doesn't resurrect just a few people. God resurrects everybody, everybody, and the entire creation to stand before him. So if we think there are some loud changes going on in our world right now, we've got another thought coming. 
Because when love takes hold of the entire creation, it's going to turn everything upside down and there are none of us who are not going to feel massive changes within us and around us. Because God is at work. Hope may be an awkward guest at our dinner tables, our hospital rooms, our funerals, and our weeping spots. And at times to think about hope may indeed feel like inviting a clown to a funeral. And you'll catch yourself wondering, dare I hope? Dare I hope? After all, we're celebrating the birth of someone 2,000 years ago in a state. In a state. Some of us have been in a state. That's not where you would expect to find hope for the world. But God is the God who creates out of nothing. God does not need or expect that things will just work out. God is the one who raises the dead, justifies the ungodly, surprises us with gifts we didn't expect and maybe didn't want. But at the same time, God has remained faithful. How many times has your life already ended? How many times have you already been in moments where you said, it's it, it's over, nothing I do, I can't fix it, and I can't live with it this way. And yet here you are. Because the hope of God keeps calling you. It says, no, I'm not going to let you go. I've made promises to you that I intend to keep. And even if you waver and fall, I am not going to let go of you. God is the God of all hope because God is pure, holy, and active love. And not even the gates of hell nor our own lack of faith and hope will ever deter the God of Jesus Christ from completing what God has promised the redemption of all things and the pure joy of God's creation in the presence of the one and only God who created and knows us all. Thanks be to God. Hope reigns today through joys. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Number 93, I believe. Lift up your heads, you mighty gates.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We try right to give our thanks and praise. O oh God, we do praise and thank you. Joining our voices with choirs of angels and all those of every time and place who love you and forever sing to the glory of your name. Please bless this prayer and make it for us the very body of Jesus. And this cup and make it for us the very blood of Jesus. Your hope for us, your hope in us, your hope for the whole world given to each of us. We are weary of the way things have been. We are weary of the way things are. In a way, we are weary of waiting to see what you will do in each of our lives and in this whole world. But we confess we probably do not yet have the faith, hope, and love to look with confidence towards the future that you plan to provide. And so may the spread of this cup strengthen us, that we may yet more deeply and more fully prepare ourselves for the day when you bring all things into the beauty of your will, and we will have no excuse for not rejoicing and singing your praises. We thank you for the arrival of Jesus Christ in this world, and we look forward to the promises that he will bring fulfillment. And so we pray this prayer as best we can with our faith in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> On the very night that he was betrayed, Jesus did a love of prayer. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming our hope in the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus. And we'll sing with you.
Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> oh God, please bless each person here. Fill each person with what they need for today and the coming days. Do not let our hope flicker. And even when it does, please continue to carry us forward. We pray for all the people that we hear about as names or countries or nations. We know that they are all living, breathing people to you. And not a sparrow falls, but that you know it. And so we again thank you for your tender and huge heart and ask that our own hearts might become more and more like yours and that the ways of Jesus Christ might be our ways, and that we would live quiet and decent and sensible lives, and at the same time, rock us with hope. We ask this in the name of Jesus himself. Amen. I think the best gifts I've ever gotten as Christmas gifts were all gifts that I didn't expect. Of course, that's kind of the nature of it, right? Christmas is supposed to be a surprise. You're really not supposed to know what you're getting. If you know what you're getting, then you're not hoping for it anymore. You're just kind of waiting for it by the clock. None of us know the future. Nobody knows the future. Whoever's predicting the future doesn't know the future. So all of us are going to be surprised what God, what God has in store for us. We may also be surprised by tough times. But here's the truth. The future belongs to God. 
And so there is always hope. In fact, that's really what we're supposed to give each other in our Christmas cards, in our Christmas greetings, and in our Christmas gifts. We're inoculating each other against one of the worst viruses among humans called hopelessness. So every card you get, every smile you get, every gift you get is another immunization against hopelessness. And so be healthy and be hopeful and share the gifts of that health and hope with the people around you because you may be the only person handing out hope to someone who badly, badly needs it. Thanks be to God for all of your generation, gen generosity and all of your kindness in every way. Amen. so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.